Conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Ladaris Cordell. I'm a retired judge here in Northern California and author of the book, Her Honor, and I'm excited to be moderating this program. I'm pleased to be joined by Mark Lamont Hill and Todd Brewster to discuss their new book, Seen and Unseen, Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for justice. Professor, commentator, and host, Mark Lamont Hill is the Steve Charles Chair in Media, Cities, and Solutions at Temple University. His career has been dedicated to educational accessibility and youth engagement in civic duty. His co-author on this book is journalist and historian Todd Brewster, who has worked as an editor for Time, in life and as a senior producer for ABC News. In today's age, exposure to racial injustice is more accessible than ever with the rise of video recording and the intimacy of technology. Seen and Unseen explores how technology and social media have irrevocably changed our conversations about race. And in many instances, tipped the levers of power in favor of the historically disadvantaged. The three of us will be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to be sure to ask them your questions too. If you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and I shall do my best to ask them. Thank you, Mark and Todd, for joining us. Thank you for having us, Lodoris. Great. Uh, the subtitle of your book is Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for Racial Justice, a topic that is not only timely, but is in great need of discussion and explanation, both of you, which you give us in this terrific book. Um, is this the first time that you two have collaborated on a book? And if so, or even if not, how did this collaboration happen? Whose idea was it? Uh, I, I take uh, full credit for all of the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it, it, it's, been a, it's been a really interesting journey. You know, Todd uh, and I have uh, known each other uh, since the uprisings in Ferguson. And we uh, became friends over that time. We, uh, we share an agent. And uh, he actually introduced us first as I was beginning to think through uh, various book projects and, and really thinking through how I could tell a story about what was happening in Ferguson, Missouri. And Todd was instrumental in helping me sort of think through ideas. And I said, this guy is a hell of a, a, a thinker with a hell of a historical sensibility. And then once the book was finished, uh, he was generous enough to give me a forward. And when I read the forward, I said, oh my God, this guy can write. <laughs> um, like write, write, you know? And then, uh, uh, Lincoln's Gamble. I went and read Lincoln's Gamble, uh, which had come out prior, but which I hadn't read uh, fully. Uh, I interviewed him uh, on Huff Post uh, when I was working there, and I got a chance to read a sort of fully detailed explanation or explication of an of a, of important historical moment. And I became really a fan of him as a writer and as a as as a historian, as an American historian. And at that point, I I wanted to. I knew at some point we'd write something together. I didn't know what it would be or when it would be, but I, I, I always thought we did, would. Uh, and to be honest, I thought it would be something about sports. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're both sports fans. Uh, he unfortunately uh, often cheers for the wrong teams. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the right side of history, typically cheering for Philadelphia teams. Uh, the arc of, of winning will eventually bend toward us. <laughs> um, and then the pandemic hit. And, uh, and Todd and I put our heads together uh, and said, you know, this might be an even more important and compelling story to tell. This may be a more exciting uh, story to tell. And lastly, I would just say, you know, I, I think that we each bring a set of gifts 
and a set of perspectives and even approaches him as a historian, me as a cultural anthropologist, you know, me as a black person, him as a white person, um, you know, that among other many other things uh, that that I think shaped our approach and there are ways that we pulled each other in different directions and, and challenged each other to think through different issues and moments uh, that have occurred recently. And, and I think that uh, hopefully this won't be our last collaboration because it, it was incredibly exciting. I learned so much. Oh. Um, both about ideas and also the craft of writing from, from Todd. Let me add just a few words to that if I can, Lador. First of all, sure. I, I've always been an admirer of, of Mark's work. And so um, I was excited to meet him. And, and, and collaborations are not, are not an easy thing. I would say there are probably more failures than there are successes on this. You have to both have respect for each other and, um, and a kind of, uh, and, and a willingness to both uh, give and, and, and take. Um, I mean, you, you, uh, you know, I, I actually believe that the best collaborations are those where, where the two writers uh, feed off of each other. They have a, you know, uh, the, it, it, we, that we end up having the kind of conversation that, um, and I hope we'll get into some of this, that the First Amendment encourages, which is that, that we, you know, Mark says something and, and I say something back and, he, and that's a perspective that he hadn't thought about. Then he adds another perspective that I hadn't thought about. And so what starts out as a, as a kernel of an idea um, becomes better through conversation, becomes better through collaboration. And we end up finding that, that what we've created together is better than either one of us could have done alone. And I, I, that's so I, I'm, I'm grateful to him for that, that, that. I'm grateful we met and I'm grateful that we've been working together. And, and I think we've produced a, a, a terrific piece of work here. Yeah, I, I know you've created a terrific book. I've read it and, and I've just, I've learned so much in your book about, for example, history of the use of images mm. in America's racial or racist history, starting with the photograph. And you describe how Black abolitionist Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, use photography. So just give us a teaser. How, how did they do this? And what impact did their efforts have in furthering the crusade for racial justice? Well, I, I, I would, I'll st jump in here and, and Mark contribute as you as you wish. I mean, um, you know, the photograph was new in the 19th century. It was new, as new as as um, social media is to us now. Um, it was exciting. It was very um, uh, um, revolutionary. Um, uh, to think about it, um, consider the fact that, and Mark referred to my Lincoln book, that um, uh, the photographs taken by Alexander Gardner at the Battle of Antietam, um, one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, changed people's understanding of the war because they had never seen, remarkably, remarkable though it may, may seem, that war was about death and an, indign and an undignified death. Um, that that, photo, that photography could have a journalistic purpose. It could show you something that you could not otherwise see. For Frederick Douglass, who was, of course, a former slave who had um, escaped and made his way north and who was a terrific orator uh, for the cause of abolition, uh, the photograph was a way of him showing the dignity of the, uh, of the Black race, showing his own dignity, being able to say that, yes, uh, he had been a slave, but he was a human being. And he was so so taken by the idea of photography and the way that it could further the cause of racial justice that he had himself photographed more times than anyone else in the 19th century, more than Lincoln, more than anybody in the theater, um, uh, more than the royal family. Uh, Frederick Douglass had loved photography, thought it would, had the opportunity to actually change the world. And in his generation, that meant still photography, but it still meant that he could show that black people were not something to be scared of. Black people had dignity. Black, black people had, had honor. Black people should be respected. This was a, a political statement in a way to have your, for your photograph taken. And so mm -hmm. the picture taking sort of that purpose, the same time that the pictures were being taken uh, to create injustices or even to record injustices as they were um, used uh, the, the photographs of the lynchings of the late 19th century, uh, which became kind of souvenir and souvenirs and postcards that white supremacists would use to show that they had been at an event. And then those same photographs were repurposed, to, repurposed by, by Ida B. Wells in the campaign against lynching, showing the inhumanity of it, the shamefulness of it. So you see that even going back 150 years or so, we have photography, technology, image making, 
at the center of the story of race in America. Yeah. What did Sojourner Truth do? What what images did she use? Well, she she used these little cards of visites, these little cards that you'd hand out in the 19th century. And and um, uh, 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 I'm trying to remember the phrase now is uh, uh, I, I, I am uh, the shadow versus the substance. Um, I saw the substance behind the shadow or something. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the quote exactly right. But the idea again there was that she was using photography, the pictures of herself, as a way of showing her own dignity, her own decency, um, and, and using them as a kind of calling card. Right. Um, so I, you know, as we go along the conversation, I, as you can tell, I'm not going to call on either one of you. So, you know, Mark, Todd, just jump in whenever yeah. you want to do it. Um, I, I, you also write, and, and Todd, you just mentioned about anti-lynching journalist Ida B. Wells. Yeah. Um, and she used her, her journalism to fight against the mainstream media's failure to accurately depict white violence against black bodies. It was as if her pen was her camera. Um, any comments about that? I know you yeah. write about it in there. So. I mean, it's a big part of this, right? That is um, writing black people and other vulnerable people into existence. You know, um, there's a way that the camera and the, the video, you know, the video camera later on, the camcorder, the cell phone, in some ways are being used to kind of highlight and mark a certain kind of humanity that the broader uh, society simply refuses to fully acknowledge. Um, Frederick Douglass, as, as Todd uh, spoke about earlier, is, is the most photographed man of his century. And part of that was the kind of fascination with this articulate, deep voiced man who could uh, tell the story about a democratic vision for the nation that was more robust and ambitious than most of his peers. Um, of course, people prefer to hear him talk about the horrors of slavery, but this was the thing, right? When, when, when Sojourner Truth says, I, I, I uh, sell the, I believe I sell the shadow to support the substance, she's attempting to play on the curiosity of the Negro um, as a means of getting something deeper. Right, pushing back both against racism, but also against liberal feminism at the time, right? And I, a woman is a declaration of a certain kind of humanity. And so these technologies were being used as a way of saying, look, we are human beings. We are real people, right? Um, during the Civil War, there were moments where, you know, it, it, Du Bois writes about this in Black Reconstruction, the idea that it wasn't until people, till Black soldiers were dying next to them and they saw them dying too, right? That they could see their humanity and that he knew that we could never go back to the days of old. But that conception now with the, through the phone, or rather through the camera, wasn't just about the interpersonal. You didn't have to go to war to see this. Now I could see these images of these people or these structures or whatever the thing might be uh, from a distance. And so now we had, we had, we had the, the ability to kind of mass mediate our humanity and our experience. That's what the novels were about, right? Written by himself, narrative of the life of this person, narrative of the life of that person, written by himself, pushing back against the idea, one, that we had, didn't have a story worth telling, and two, that we couldn't write it. Right. So... All of these things are, are, are opportunities and, and technologies and tools that are being used uh, to, to, to help us tell a story. And so by the time you get to Ida B. Wells Barnett um, and she is showing lynching, she is reappropriating in some ways, right? It's not enough that, her, so your, your point is about her pen and you're right. She, she's writing about lynching, right? When she, whether you're reading Red Record, whatever it is, right? You're hearing about the bloodiness and the gruesomeness of the American lynching project. And then the use of the photographs is being used to amplify that and to add some materiality and texture to it. So now people see this and they're like, oh my God. And, but again, the context matters. And it's something we get into in the book because mm -hmm. those same images were on postcards that many white Americans were using to celebrate, exactly. to party, to use mm -hmm. the lynching as the first national pastime. Right. So they were saying, look, Look at what we're doing here, even taking body parts as souvenirs, but in the hands of her and her context, with her writing, with her uh, urgency, suddenly we had a different story. And throughout the book, we talk about that, right? Whether right. it's Birth of a Nation, whether it's Kyle Rittenhouse, whatever it is, there are right. ways that a text, when situated within a certain context, can tell a very different story than somebody else's. Exactly. And so Ida B. Wells became the freedom fighter who allowed us to see that. Got it. So you, you wrote in your book, and I'm going to quote from it, long before cell phone video and body cams, before surveillance cameras and the advent of photojournalism, film was being utilized to frame the story of race in America. 
And then you go on and write, movies were the first example of a mass form of media. Uh, so the film you describe in some detail in the book is The Birth of a Nation. So for those who are not that familiar with it, or maybe have heard the, the name, um, can you tell us about it and why this film was such an influence upon both white America and black America? Well, the, the, the birth of a nation is, is a, a technological wonder. I mean, the best thing I could compare it to would be to the Triumph of the Will, which was a remarkable documentary film that uh, Lenny Riefenstahl did uh, to support um, the Nazi cause in Germany in the 1930s, where you could look at the film and you go, wow, what's an amazing film, um, but it serves such a dark and sinister purpose. Um, the same thing was true with The Birth of a Nation, except it was an American film. And it was an American film that attempted to tell the story of the Civil War in a different way. In The, in the Birth of a Nation, uh, the Civil War um, gets the lost cause um, uh, uh, applied to it. The cause that the idea that the South only lost because the, the North had greater numbers, the South lost because the North had all the money and the, and the industrial capitalism and that the, uh, the, the greater, the greater pin principle at, at risk in, in the Civil War, the higher ground morally was with the South. It wasn't about slavery, right? That it wasn't about slavery, right. that it was about states' rights, that it was about the intrusion of the uh, industrial capitalism and the, uh, in, into the South, um, that, that it was uh, about the perversion of the, the original American idea of freedom. Um, they failed to, it fails to uh, acknowledge that the other original American idea, the one that we only recapture with the Civil War, is equality, but that's another subject. Anyway, The Birth of a Nation is the story, in, in some ways, of, of uh, the reuniting of the North and the South. Um, uh, it tells the stories of two families that are one Northern, one Southern, and, um, and the story of the Civil War and how it tore them apart. And by the end of the film, those two white families have come together and rejoined uh, their common identity as Americans. In the process, Black people who had been put in positions of political power by Reconstruction, very briefly, are portrayed as lazy, corrupt, um, ignorant, um, uh, and a, a mistake of American history uh, to have entrusted them with any power. The, the birth of a nation is a tool for the uh, rise of the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, in, in Atlanta, at the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, advertisements for the, the film when it first came out, would appear side by side with advertisements recruiting people for the Ku Klux Klan. Um, it was in many ways the underpinning and the sort of dramatization of Jim Crow and why Jim Crow needed to be instituted uh, in the South. So it had a tremendously powerful effect upon the country. And you see the residue of it, not only through the Gone with the Wind, which became a popular film a, a, a couple of decades later, centralization, centralization of the plantation story of the South, but right into our own time. We see a kind of over sentimentalization of Southern uh, culture in what we are witnessing in our own time. And, in, and with respect to our, 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 the events of the past few years, particularly the one, the March on Charlottesville, we see some of the same themes that emerged in the birth of a nation getting resurrected. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the film, right, was was viewed, right? There was a viewing at the White House, is yes. that right? It was the first film uh, shown yeah. at the White House. Good old President Woodrow Wilson screened it, which also gives you a sense about the relationship of power, relationships, with, relationships of power to these technologies and texts. It's not just um, who records it, who has the power to confirm or aver the legitimacy of a text, who has the ability to say, this is something we should be invested in or reading. And I mean, imagine if uh, Donald Trump comes out and says, you know, this Kyle Rittenhouse guy is amazing. Let's, let's, let's screen his videos at the White House, right? Just as an example, right? Um, it also speaks to resources. Um, as we talk about in the book, Marcus Garvey uh, was outraged by this. Baldwin, you know, uh, later would remark on it. Uh, Marcus uh, Du Bois, Garvey, Ball, all of them, you know, they're talking about this stuff. And they wanted to make a counterfilm, Baldwin and Garvey. I'm sorry, Du Bois and Garvey. And they didn't uh, because they didn't have the resources. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just about who's there to capture a story, who has the resources to produce a narrative, who has the tools to access the technology. I mean, the great thing about this moment is that it's much easier to make things, to produce content, right? right? This, yeah. this, this phone will produce content. 
yeah. Back then, it was much more challenging. Yeah. Uh, you chose three incidents to take us through your discussion of the evolution of technology's impact on the fight for racial justice. The, and so the three, the, the on-camera and agonizingly slow-motion murder of George Floyd in May 2020. And then you talk in depth about the murder of Ahmaud Arbery in February 2020 in Brunswick, Georgia. It was like three months before George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the murders of Joe Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber by Kyle Rittenhouse in August 2020 during the protest following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Now, as I read your book and read about these, um, I learned so much more than I thought I knew about these incidents. But sadly, it, there are many more such incidents, right, from which to choose. I mean, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin. So my, my question is initially, why focus upon these three incidents? You know, there's, and we could add, although it's not a death, you know, but, you know, when a woman is standing outside of a gentleman's club and she gets uh, held by security and she starts making a viral, which would become a viral meme screaming, you about to lose your job, right? That's also a marker of certain kinds of possibilities for the technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the confidence that she felt knowing that because the camera was rolling, she might be safer and that there might be some sense of accountability and justice. That now with a camera rolling, somebody, not in this case, not a police officer, but a security officer, uh, might actually lose their job. They might be held accountable. I mean, th th there's something to that. And, and of course, there's a there's a whole story about how she became the kind of spectacle of social media, uh, despite some really harsh sort of personal experiences and outcomes that she was she was wrestling with. Um, but to answer your question, I, I think that um, we could have easily taken Christian Cooper, who was bird watching in Central Park. Um, it would have been very easy to capture that. We could have captured Tamir Rice, you know, who's 12 but looks 20 to the police, um, holding a, a, a toy gun. We could have, we could have done many, we could have used many of these cases. There's no shortage of them. We could have looked at Walter Scott ru running with his back to him, with his back to the police officer who shoots him. We could have done Walter Wallace Jr. who had a knife when police shot him in Philadelphia in 2020. But I think there's something about these cases. One, these cases uh, shaped and really filled the public discourse in ways that the others didn't, in, in my estimation. I'd be curious to know how Todd thinks about this. Because we, we, I'll say this, we didn't have a lot of difficulty coming up with the cases. If anything, we, 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 had, we may have had to scale back a couple. You know, I, I, Chris, Christian Cooper uh, probably would have, initially was in our minds, and then we decided to not to do it. Um, not because it wasn't an important, compelling story, but again, it was space, time, depth, you know, all, this, all, all the reasons, you know, authors make decisions. But I think it was that these cases were, were very prominent cases. These cases each illustrated a, a specific dimension of what we're talking about, whether it's the influencer in the case of, you know, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse and other, you know, it, it, they each spoke to a different thing, the spectacle of death, you know, speaks to a specific thing when we look at a, a George Floyd. So I think it was about the, the, the types of cases, and, but also their impact in, in the public conversation. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I would say. I mean, Todd, what do you- Yeah, I, I, I would add a few things to that, um, mm -hmm. uh, Doris. The, um, I think each of them shows a different thing about the way that technology functions into our understanding of that particular story and the broader story of race in America. How so? I mean, well, if you look at the story of George Floyd, I mean, mm -hmm. Um, I, I think one of the things that the book answers is the question, why did George Floyd create an international outrage and put people out into the streets protesting for justice? And I think there are multiple reasons. One is, had to do with COVID. One had to do with, with um, the sheer number of instant incidents that, that we witnessed in this country of police violence over the past few years, um, the growing sense of outrage. But uh, another part of it, and I think a key part of it, was the way in which the story emerges for us to see. Uh, I think we use the phrase in the book that a, a, uh, a shooting is an instant, a lynching is a performance. And George Floyd was essentially lynched on the streets of Minneapolis. Um, it's not uh, something that happens quickly. 
In fact, as you will remember, one of the things that was stressed over and over again about George Floyd was that the knee was on the neck for almost nine minutes. Mm. And the video, therefore, uh, is excruciating. It's not, I mean, there's nothing fun about parsing different methods of killing. But uh, a, a shooting is one thing. But watching someone die is like a crucifixion. And I do think there were sort of religious overtones to this. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, have, we have George Floyd calling for his mother the way that Christ called for his father. Um, we have th th this sense of, of death happening before a crowd. Um, in this case, a crowd that could pull out their cell phones and film it. But there were people who were shouting from the streets at the, at the, at the cops who were uh, 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 um, uh, surrounding George Floyd, uh, calling them names. Um, uh, but, but the George Floyd video operated on two levels. One was the level of video and of narrative, and therefore the, the length of time, the elapsing of time while someone is dying in front of you and we all felt helpless, right? The other was, ironically, as a still image, the image of the knee on the neck is a symbolic statement about the story of race in America. Uh, it's an image that has been used by racial activists for generations to say, uh, I think with Baldwin himself, who said, what we want you to get is to get your knee off our neck or your foot off our neck. We want white people to stop holding us down. But here he was an image of a black man being held down by the knee of a man with a nonchalant expression on his face. And it resonated with images that frankly are are, are, are important and, and significant in American history. We, in the book, we talk about the, it's not a, a race image, but the image of, of the, the, the um, Kent State killings from, from the uh, right. 1970 and the, and, the, and the protesting over the civil, over the, I'm sorry, over the Vietnam War, where the, the same choreography is there. There's the, the, the um, runaway uh, uh, woman who's, who's got her knee down looking up at the camera. There's the dead um, student lying in front of her and she's got her hands out, uh, out, outstretched as if to ask why, right? Become a very iconic photograph about Vietnam and the, and the treatment of Vietnam uh, War protesters by, by the state. Um, that kind of, that, that notion that there's, that there's a, a, a choreography to an image that makes it powerful and symbolic resonated in George Floyd and the image of that. Yeah. Then you move on to Ahmaud Arbery. And what he really was about, that story, Mark alluded to it before, uh, it, was a, it, it was the campaign. You know, it was the fact that the killing of Ahmaud Arbery had happened, I think, in, in February. Yes. And then mm -hmm. it took several months for the, for the, the campaign for, for, uh, uh, um, for uh, prosecution built. And, I mean, if it had been left to the, to the prosecutors in Glynn County there, there never would have been a prosecution of, of, of the... Um, uh, the McMichaels, Gregory and Trevor's Mc, Trevor Mc, McMichaels, who Travis McMichael, who um, who are uh, along with Roddy Bryan, were the killers of of Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, it would have uh, been swept under the rug. We would never have known about it, except that there happened to be a video, and the video galvanized the opposition. And it was a galvanized video that. But, and it was a video that wasn't from some bystanders who were opposed to what was going on. It they it was internally they videoed their own their own conduct Isn't how ironic right? yes yeah. how ironic yeah how ironic and and mm -hmm. and and yet that alone was still not enough right for the prosecutors to pursue justice it took those on the street who then used that video to be able to build the campaign and see that they were brought to justice and then the, the last one kenosha is is a very interesting one with mark referred before about the to, to the notion of um, uh, the, the images of, uh, from the time of Ida B. Wells were the same images that she was using to, sh to shame the country were the ones that um, the uh, white supremacists had used in order to celebrate the, the lynching of black people. Well, in Kenosha, we see videos created from several different directions about the same event. And we, uh, uh, the same footage used in, uh, to help hold up Kyle Rittenhouse as a hero can be used to show Kyle Rittenhouse as the aggressor. And so it, it teaches us that video itself is sort of amoral. 
we need people to instruct. We need curators. We need instruction. We need people to point out, as Ida B. Wells did, and say, look at this. Look at this. See what I'm seeing. Because without the, the finger pointing, without someone to let us know what it is they're observing, then the, the image doesn't take on its power. Mark, do you want to add anything? That was, that was masterful. See, that's why, that's why, <laughs> that's why I work with this guy, man. What? I can't tell that any better. <laughs> <laughs> so I am curious about why um, you didn't include the story of the beating of Rodney King in your book. I, I mean, there was a video of the incident filmed by a bystander, followed by protests. This was all in L.A. in response to the jury verdict acquitting the L.A. PD. Um, so was Rodney King a subject of discussion at all when you were writing this book? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's impossible to uh, talk about this incident without, the, the story rather, without talking about uh, Rodney King. Uh, in some ways, Rodney King start, is, is the kind of starting point of this conversation about media, social media technology and the fight for racial justice, at least the modern tech, modern digital technology. Um, we focused on these extremely modern cases and sort of juxtaposed them to these deeply rooted historical cases to show that there's a long historical thread here. Um, but, I, but I think particularly as we are 30 years past the uprisings in LA and 31 years past the actual beating of Rodney King, it's certainly appropriate to think about those things in relation to what we saw. Uh, Rodney King is in some ways a very different case though, to the extent that the, the gentleman who records Rodney King is um, sort of what, what Sidney Hook would call uh, the eventful man. He, he, Sidney Hook dis distinguishes between the kind of eventful man and the e event-making man. The eventful man is someone who uh, is swept up in the throes of history and an extraordinary thing happens, uh, as opposed to the event-making man who, th through their unique talents and intentionality, kind of produce a, 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 his a historical shift, right? So, you know, this gentleman was just learning how to be a photographer. He was, you know, he was a, he was a, a plumber trying to learn how to be a photographer and a videographer, and He's out there shooting, just looking and putting equipment together and then comes up and bumps into this shooting. I mean, this beating, excuse me. Uh, and the beating is gruesome and he captures all of it. And he says, somebody has to see this. And I think that's important because this, it was one of those moments where the technology allowed America to have a window into a, a, just one of the most gruesome forms of ritual state violence that we, that we have, mm -hmm. right? And black people would say, oh my God, now they see what we saw and what we know. And many white Americans at the time in the polls substantiated this and said, oh my God, I didn't know this was happening. And then many black people said, no, you didn't wanna know this was happening. We've always said this, but our words, our witness was insufficient. But now with the video, you can't deny it until they denied it. Until the, juror, juries, the jurors were, com were convinced to not believe their lying eyes and instead to believe the prosecutor's tale of uh, of a PCP taking uh, monster who would have pillaged and destroyed an entire city had he not been kept at bay by these brave officers with batons. I mean, this is the absurdity of the narrative they offer, but it's what was offered. Um, I think that that's an important starting point. I think it's, again, it's important to reflect on that moment a lot, but I think there's something different about that and what Darnella Frazier does. Darnella Frazier, the woman who, who captures the beating, the, beat, the, the, the lynching effectively of George Floyd is representative more of the same, the person who, who, who captures Eric Garner, the person who captures Walter Scott, to the extent that these are people who weren't lucky. They didn't just happen to bump into this image it's, they, they happen to be in that space, but this phone is ubiquitous. Everybody has one of these. And at this juncture in history, you don't have to be lucky, right? There's an extraordinary bravery it takes to, to capture that. And it's, it seems to me the only one who felt guilty in that scene was Darnella Frazier who wished she had done more. Mm 
ironically, right? This brave black woman who took who videotaped. It. But my point is the, 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 the capturing of this in these moments and to me are different uh, to the extent that they speak to the possibility of everyday citizens capturing, of jumping into the fray, of being able to engage, of being able to hold power accountable through everyday means of practice, right? They didn't have to run, get a video crew. They didn't have to, you know, Philando Castillo didn't have to, you know, you know, you know, go to a studio. He could just live stream what was happening to him in that car, right? There's a way that we can tell our own stories now and tell the stories of others through this technology. And so for me, the Rodney King thing is an important way to say, okay, this is the first time technology might have gave, given us a window, but it's still very different than the kind of everyday usages that are taking place right now. And so for me, those stories uh, were more compelling. And then lastly, a very practical thing, I think, is that Rodney King's been written about so much and talked about so much. And there's always room to talk about it more. Um, and as a Californian, even though you're in Northern California, I know that it's a particularly important topic. Um, but, you know, for us, I think the stories that we told and juxtaposing them to a deeper history, not 1991, but, you know, 1891, mm -hmm. uh, uh, allows people to see a longer historical kind of journey uh, of how we use these technologies to help us get free. You know, I, um, I, I'd, I'd add just a couple of things to that. And, uh, uh, and I know Mark, Mark um, has made this point before that Rodney King felt to people like they could explain it away as an outlier that it was all right you mean you no. mean to white people yes because black white folks people. knew it wasn't an oh outlier. i know <laughs> right. very true yeah, very fair right i know but i'm but uh but what we're talking about when we talk about uh, uh the, the enormous attention that came on george floyd is that the wider constituency began to wake up to that right and and i think with with uh um rodney king there was this sense that oh yeah that was terrible but you know, policing is a dirty business, and uh, uh, maybe we just um, you know we we got to, we got to see just how difficult that is at times. Not re not willing yet to to accept the ubiquity right of of these experiences, as Mark just pointed out. When we democratize our our technology to the point where the cell phone we carry around sophisticated uh, um, film equipment with us everywhere we go. Now we can see it over and over and over again. And the fact that, that, that Darnella Frazier is walking on her way someplace else with every intention to live her life in the way that she would have lived it that day. And suddenly she becomes the agent to racial, uh, uh, um, to, to the uh, um, uh, racial violence like no one else has in human history is, is a stunning statement about the technology. And one more point about why that, this and not running we wanted people to see what was happening in these few years we our earliest uh, episode is the charlottesville episode was 2017 so 2017 that's five years to 2022 that pulsated with this historical uh, uh underpinning that that uh, yes uh, it, it begins with rodney king and we frankly just as easily could have brought in Rodney King at some point, but analyzing it wouldn't have been some of the same level of effectiveness as taking these events in our own time. We live in a time that values the present, sees the world through the present. To see that and understand that, oh, these things are not operating in a vacuum. This is still the residue of, of the birth of a nation. This is still the residue of the uh, lynching era. This is still the residue of the Ku Klux Klan, of the, of the, of the lost cause. This is the residue of centuries of racial animosity and abuse. Uh, I think that was really important. Got it. Um, I, I want to take some time here to talk about James Baldwin. Um, you, if you wrote about him, and, and a quote from the book is that although he came of age as a cultural figure in the 1950s, he is a 21st century influencer. Um, and it's my guess uh, that uh, at least in part, the title of your book, Seen and Unseen, uh, was motivated or taken from the words of Baldwin. And, and you quote in the book, um, seeing is a both cognitive and optical activity. And that again, as Baldwin told us, and I'm quoting now from Baldwin, the visible reality hides a deeper one. And that in the end, all our action and achievement rests on things unseen. The man had an amazing way with words. So talk to us about James Baldwin and, and 
Why, how has he become such an influencer today? Such an interesting question. Um, I think the, the, the fundamental reason is because he's a genius, right? Yeah. And, and I'd like to think that genius can transcend time and space uh, when seized, when recognized, when appreciated. So when I look at Baldwin being used now, when I look at uh, how influential Basquiat has become now, or, or you know, how compelling uh, Asana Shakur's words are as an activist now, right? You can't go to a rally without he without hearing people say, um, "We have a It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains." You can't be at a rally and, 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 and avoid that. Those words were written 40 years ago by, or 30 years ago by Asada Shakur. As she lives in Cuba, Asada Shakur has not been in the United States since she fled for Cuba in 1984. And yet it matters. Baldwin's words, whether it's words that he said while debating on te television, debating Yale philosophers, or whether it's words from uh, his books or his writings or his speeches, Baldwin continues to matter because he is a genius. Uh, so I think that's key, right? Baldwin was ahead of his time. Um, that also, it, it's why young people today will believe that no basketball player 30 years ago could have possibly play in today's NBA except Michael Jordan, right? No one denies that, right? Because he was so ahead of his time that people can see him fitting. Baldwin had a certain kind of intersectional analysis and analysis of race and gender and class that mattered. He had a, a, a kind of secular sensibility despite his, his religious background that, that fits with today's kind of post-ecclesiastical kind of, kind of generation of people. We were in Ferguson and preachers were, were not the center of the of attention. So there's a way that Baldwin fits. There's also a way that Baldwin's writing, his, his turns of phrase, uh, the pithiness of his, of his expressions are perfect for Twitter. And especially one, 140 characters, on, you know, now you get, now, now they added more and I was like, oh, but not too much, right? So you still need cleverness. You still need to be able to turn a phrase. Baldwin is able to turn a phrase. And even though some of the phrases we turn or we see Baldwin turn ain't really Baldwin's phrases anymore, by the time they get turned, turned in and around, they still speak to a certain kind of sensibility. And so it's no surprise to me that Baldwin is a darling of this moment and of this movement. Uh, and I'm incredibly fascinated by people's relationships to him and, and which parts of Baldwin. I mean, uh, we we go. Todd and I are probably in the in, in the minority of people who actually highly regard uh, evidence of things not seen. You know, Baldwin's last regular in the Atlanta child murders, right? Which also is part of the subtext of our title. So there's a way that um, there's a way that sort of we connect to certain pieces of Baldwin. Others connect to Giovanni's room. Others connect to. Go tell it on a mountain. Others connect to fire next time, of course. Others connect to you. You get the point. And so, yeah. Um, so I, I think, but Baldwin's power in this moment isn't, and our decision to write about it isn't just about Baldwin. It's about the way that social media allows the influencer to emerge. It, it's the way that it allows ideas and words to be maneuvered and manipulated and twisted and changed, sometimes for good and sometimes not for good. Yeah. Um, and, and that speaks to how and we think and talk about race in America. Yeah. Well, one yeah. of the, let me just add, add one more quick thing. One, one of the uh, tests of art, I think, is, is its durability, right? Of course, mm. it, it, does it, right. Does it, 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 it does it apply only to its own time or is it, is it, is it, does it resonate with a certain truth that carries on? Baldwin carries on. Uh, I'm looking at this quote that, that we highlighted in the book where he said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And you, you take that expression, first off, there's sure, sure, sheer poetry to it in its, in its, in its joining of opposites. Uh, but it also has a, a, a deep resonance because it carries on in multiple arenas. It goes into different places. I mean, what, what Baldwin actually was referring to there was was his own struggles as a right being accepted as a writer, a pure writer, not just a black writer, um, and and yet the, the statement has meaning that goes well beyond that context, and I think that's what Baldwin has over and over and over again in his writing. Yeah, I, I, again, referring to your book, you say um, what he is one of the most frequently cited Black Lives Matter counter public voices, 
And he is, quote, the movement's literary touchstone, conscience, and pinup, as well as its most tweeted literary authority. You know, I, I just wonder how many people actually who are tweeting out these wonderful uh, sentences and phrases by Baldwin have actually read his work. Uh, you know, it's my hope that people will do that because it's so easy in the, the air, this age of social media to just kind of pick up these little phrases or pick up sound bites. So I, I'm hoping and encouraging people who love the words of Baldwin to actually read his works. You know, I think Baldwin would be tickled by that, by, by what's happening. Don't you think, Mark? I mean, absolutely. I, I absolutely. think he would have loved, loved the idea that people are, you know, uh, we, we use the phrase of pulling apart, pulling apart like taffy, you know, sort of playing with it. He loved words. He, he was, you know, his, his first intended profession was as a preacher. You could just see he, that, that he would have loved this sort of, the the, uh, the, uh, um, the the antiphonal response coming from the from the congregation, you know, um, and 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 that's what Twitter is in some ways, right? It's like the the preacher speaking to the congregation, the congregation coming back with something else, and something you create something together. So I want to I want to pick up on that, Todd. So mm -hmm. first of all, what is Black Twitter? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I mean, is there a brown Twitter? Is there a Jewish Twitter? There's Black Twitter. So first of all. What is it? Mark, you take that one. Yeah, you know, there, there are definitely lots of spaces on Twitter. And, you know, there's NBA Twitter. I'm a basketball nerd. Uh, and uh, there are, um, there, there's certainly many subsections and pockets uh, of, of Twitter. When, when Twitter first started, um, you know, I would say I was one of the early sort of people on Twitter. And there was definitely a community of Black people uh, who were sharing ideas and conversations um, sharing articles, sharing jokes, communicating with one another. Um, and it very much felt like what I talk about in my research as, as, as a counter public space. I didn't, Nancy Frazier's notion of the counter public, what I call the digital counter public. So it's a way of saying, look, there's always, there's a public sphere, but we often romanticize the public sphere. This idea that there's a place where we can all come together in democratic dialogue. And we ignore the fact that those places have been homophobic. Those places have been exclusionary. Those spaces have been anti-black. Those spaces have been sexist, et cetera. And so we have always crafted counter publics. And so in the context of Twitter, which is a public sphere, ostensibly everyone can access it. But what's the conversation that's happening? What's the dialogue that's happening? Who are our communities? Um, the hashtag was initially created as an organizing tool. It's some, some new school Dewey Decimal type stuff, you know? Um, and then Black folk, which is often what we see, right, is the repurposing of things, right? With Melville Herskovitz called the deification of accidents. We started taking the, uh, the hashtag and using it not just to organize so that I could go back and see how many people are talking about the election, but the hashtag became a way of communicating. It became a way of using of indirection, uh, what we call signifying. It became a way of starting campaigns. It became a way of doing other stuff. And that's a piece of what Black Twitter was about. And so suddenly, not only were people having their own conversations, but we could find those conversations through the hashtag and through who we followed and through who we were tagging and who we were retweeting, et cetera. And so this became our pocket of Black people who were thinking about ideas. Doesn't mean that everybody who's Black and on Twitter is part of Black Twitter, um, but it does mean that there's a, a specific space. Is there a, a brown Twitter? Is there a Jewish Twitter? Is there an Arab Twitter? Is there a, a, a NBA Twitter, a queer Twitter, a, a, a knitting Twitter? Sure, there's all kinds of subgroups. Um, but I think there's something specific about Black Twitter in terms of how, and not exclusively Black Twitter, but there's something about Black Twitter in particular in terms of the ways that we uh, engage the politics of the day, in terms of the types of campaigns we start, in terms of the type of movements that we help animate. I mean, Black Lives Matter emerges on Black Twitter. You know, Oscars so white emerge on Black Twitter. So these aren't just conversations. These are often movements that have shaped the very fabric, the very structure of American democracy, and American culture. You know, it's interesting. I, I would actually add to that, that, you know, the image we use in the book is that um, the world of social media is like, it's like a souk, like a, you know, a Middle Eastern souk. It's like a marketplace where there's, there's people shouting for attention. And, uh, but, the, but the default, the human default is towards order and um, community. And what happens in a souk is that people who with like-minded desire for goods eventually find their way together and they negotiate a price. What happens in Twitter is that people of like-mindedness start to emerge in, in communities that allow them to effective 
uh, do effective action. And so it, it's it's actually a wonderful arena for study because it tells us something about, about human nature, about our need for each other, right? But it also shows you the importance, as we said earlier in the conversation, about the curatorial role, right? It's not just that we're all individual actors here. We are actors who need to be uh, organized and the organization comes with those who are who seek to make sense of what is around them and then project that that is that image of sense to those who are of like mind like interesting value. yeah i mean i've looked and you know I, I go on black twitter and a couple of things i've noticed i mean one is that when people disagree there isn't there's just not a lot of hate on black twitter there aren't people that are just totally gone off the rails which one can see um, and Twitter and, and other places. And, and I also wonder whether or not Black Twitter, it, it's just another way to in which Black folks are being seen. Um, so any any follow up? Because, well, let me, let me follow up by just saying that my next question to you all is, what do you think will happen to Twitter if Elon Musk, in fact, buys it, if he owns that platform? You know, I, I, I talked about the counter publics that idea of a counter public is predicated on the idea that it's a public sphere in the first place. Um, what we've seen in neoliberal sort of America, really around the globe, is the privatization of the public good. And so Elon Musk taking over Twitter for me takes what is at least functioning as ostensibly a, a, a public sphere. And it's not, I mean, it's always has it's always ruled by corporate logics and capital and such but there's something about him saying you know what i don't like the way this thing is going i'm gonna buy it that speaks to a certain kind of to me a certain kind of cynical politics but also uh forecloses on certain po democratic possibilities and there's something it might seem counterintuitive but the idea of saying well you know we'll bring trump back and all free speech is back and you can say what you want on here it seems like we're opening it up but what we don't think about is the exclusionary violence of the public sphere we don't think about the ways that allowing the anti-Semite or the uh, or, or 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 the white anti-black racist or the or even if we take race out of it, if, if we race and identity out of it, and, and we, or you know, and ethnicity out of it, we talk about um, people who may say really objectionable things about children that may not technically be illegal, but might be disgusting to all of us. Um, and saying, well, they're allowed to say what they want to say. Right? How does the space become unsafe? How does it become a space of violence? How does it, you know, somebody, what happens when Donald Trump gives more bad information or disinformation around public health or says something that leads people to go to a Capitol building and have an insurrection? Just for example, hypothetically speaking, right? If these things happen and we, and we protect all of it under the guise of free speech, what's at stake? So for me, and I'm only speaking for me, I'm not speaking for Todd or this book when I say this, uh, I, I am deeply terrified of what it means for Elon Musk to buy this. Um, and I don't, I am not somebody who wants to silence dissenting voices. I'm not someone who wants everybody who disagrees with me to be blocked and deleted. So for me to say this, it takes a lot. What, what terrifies you though? I worry that Twitter will become an unsafe space, that the space that allowed us to scream Black Lives Matter, the space that allowed us to counter narrate the struggles of Ferguson, the space that allowed us to talk about black girl hair, is gonna be a place where we don't feel safe and a place where people will be targeted and a place where people will be doxxed and harassed and, 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 and harmed both emotionally and potentially physically. Right, but so by that, you mean that if Musk were to own the platform, he would what, lift any kind of regulation? Yeah. Of speech and that's that's the concern then it's the wild wild west it's just wild, anything wild goes west. right and for some people that's a ro they, they romanticize the wild wild west and they see it as the ultimate uh articulation of free speech and democrat Amer american democratic liberty um i see it a little differently yeah i, I see it as chaos and, and not a constructive chaos yeah. is i don't think ever constructive but i i certainly well, see it that way and, and it concerns that, me as well. Yeah, I just want to add one thing because you—that's a very important word that you use there, uh, constructive. And 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 Mark and I have talked about this at length. The, you know, the the concept of the freedom of speech is not is not one of um, chaos. Um, that was not the intention of the founders. It's not the intention of of those most of those who prize it. The the uh, value of freedom of speech is that you have a vigorous and robust 
dialogue between people who care deeply about what it is they're constructing. And that means, yes, tolerating dissent, tolerating the outrageous voice, and even, even the, um, the, the offensive voice. But when it becomes assaultative, when it becomes violence through words, when it becomes uh, more like conduct, and you're a former judge, you know this, where, you know, the, 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 when, when, con- when speech changes from communicative purpose to one of conduct, it can become assaultative. And, that, and in that case, um, it loses its communicative value. It's not constructive. The notion that, that and I, we referenced this earlier in the conversation, that, and I think we were just talking about how Mark and I work together, the idea of, of you know, w- one person saying one thing and the other person saying something else, and that together you create a, a better whole. I mean, I always say, when I teach the First Amendment about that, that it, I ask students, what do they think the freedom of speech is? And they say, well, we can say whatever we want. And I say, well, that's sort of true, but not completely. You know, there's, there's regulations here. There's things you can't, you can't say, you can't produce uh, uh, child pornography first amendment won't allow you to do that you can't have you can't issue fighting words uh, uh that the first amendment won't let you, won't you do that uh, uh but um the, the, but the freedom of speech also incorporates this notion that you have to listen that that you you need to be a participant in the reception of of the speech of another as well as the projection of speech and third you have to be willing to be changed by what you hear in other words you have to greet it you can greet the speech in a communicatarian way. Yes. That says that I value what you say. I value, I want to know what you feel, even if maybe diametric opposed to what I feel. Because if we don't have those qualities to it, then the freedom of speech is not a constructive um, uh, 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 principle. It becomes um, more like, as you said, chaos in the wild, wild west. Yeah, I just feel that here in, at this time in America, we are so far away from what you described as um, you know, speaking, listening, and perhaps changing views. I, I feel we have we are so far from that now, um, which concerns me. And also, I mean, we know the First Amendment deals with government regulation. So if if Twitter is owned by Elon Musk and it is entirely privately owned, it's his toy with which to play. He doesn't. He can. He doesn't have. There's no government regulation there in terms of free speech. He can allow anything he wants. And, and that certainly is, I think, should be a concern for everybody. Um, so I have a, a question here from uh, some of our uh, folks who are listening. And there are two questions. I'm going to ask them both because they are about the same subject. So the first question is, are there any statistics showing police work has improved because of technology and monitoring? And the second question, along the same line, can you say any more about how technology outside of social media is being used to keep police and government accountable? Mm, that's an interesting question. I, I'm going to just speak really briefly. First, I disclaimer, I come out of the abolitionist tradition. So um, made very famous in Northern California by the great Angela Davis and Joy James and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and others from the critical resistance movement. And so I don't, I, I come from a place, and this is not the, in the book, um, but I come from a place of believing that a world without policing and a world without prisons is possible and, and, and necessary. So I don't look to police reforms as the kind of uh, the key to getting creating justice. I look to reimagining the system itself. Um, but the conversation about body cameras, for example, has been key to many of the demands that came out of Ferguson. We want and there was a big debate between us, right? Which was, you know, do the body cameras make police more accountable? Is this a reform that gets in the way of a real change? Or is it a reform that allows us to move towards structural change? Because some reforms are okay, right? If they can still move, you know, getting rid of bail is a reform, uh, getting rid of cash bail, but it's a reform toward decarceration. It's, a, it's, it's an abolitionist reform, as opposed to saying, okay, policing can work if we could just put cameras on them. And the problem with that approach, in my estimation, uh, and, I, and I don't have I don't have the data on this, but I I can speak from, from a more sort of philosophical perspective on this is that, and then I'll give you some some things mildly empirical. Um, let me start with that first. Uh, most of these cases um, where po- police body cameras are far more used to exonerate police officers than they are to convict them. That's that's a fact. So let let me let me that that's a fact, right? Um, 
And for some, that might be a good thing, right? You know, the cops are proving that it wasn't a bad shoot, that, it, that, they, that, they, that they had to, that they were just defending themselves or that they didn't do this or that they di didn't do that. Uh, I think part of the challenge of the body camera is that it still captures what the police cap what the police have captured, that it doesn't give us some before and after context. And it also places the juror in, in, in the position of deciding what, not just what the reasonable man would do, reasonable man standard, but also what the reasonable cop standard would be. Um, and if we live in a society that continues to sentimentalize police and continues to believe, give police benefit of the doubt, then the, then the camera doesn't necessarily absolve them. Can the camera be helpful? Absolutely. We saw that in Grand Rapids recently, right? I'm not saying cameras don't do any good. I'm saying that cameras may not solve the fundamental problem. For me, the fun, but for me, and I'm only speaking for myself here, the fundamental problem isn't uh, bad cops. It isn't bad apples. It, it, it's, it's a system itself uh, that needs to be reimagined. I would add one thing to that. Uh, I, I mean, I obviously don't come out of the same abolitionist tradition as, as Mark, but, but I think what I would focus on here is that, uh, and what the book is really about, I think, is understanding both the benefits and the limits of technology. Mark referred to the space that happens beyond the, the rectangle of the screen, right? Um, what happened before the camera was turned on, what happened after the camera was turned off. We see that laid out in some detail in, in Seen and Unseen. Uh, but I think what we also see is that, uh, as we alluded to before, technology is is, is uh, amoral. Um, it's those of us who bring values to the use of technology that will help change uh, society. And uh, from this, we're speaking from a macro position, obviously, but it's the same one that Baldwin occupied, in that Baldwin felt that, you know, movements to I me, mean, he somewhat mocked the, the March on Washington, he he mocked reforms of um, uh, affirmative action. Um, he, he felt that uh, uh, the, these gestures were like band-aids. I mean, they were, uh, uh, they didn't get at the root problem, which was uh, essentially white people understanding uh, the, the sins that we had committed and dealing with that fact, uh, admitting to it, recognizing our history, seeing what we had created. And there's there's no there's no uh, a shame in that. In fact, there's there's great honor in being able to accept the flaws of the human condition and the flaws of human action. Um, I, I think it's in, in fact I think as he said in that in that quote I mentioned before, nothing that not everything that that that, that is faced can be changed, but um, nothing can be changed until it, it is faced. What he meant was facing what we are as a society, what we have done. And only when we accept that can we move forward. And this is, you know, this is not only, as Mark alluded to, I think before, it's not only white people; it's also black people who accepted a certain racial hierarchy that um, was imposed upon all of us. And and I and I think it's important that we look at things the way that Baldwin do, did in order to get at what the true solution was, which may take generations, but that should be at the forefront of how we think about this. Well, well. Absolutely. Mark, did you have something else? No, I just said absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. So we've now reached the point in our program where it's time to, to wrap things up. I do have one final question for you. But before I, I ask both of you this, I just want to say to those listening, this book is amazing. Um, there are so many just gems in it. And, and I'll just give you a couple of, of them. Um, there's, a, there's a line in the book that says, the internet is to our time as the locomotive was then. I mean, so, they, and they talk about it and I hadn't even thought about that. And then there's another one. I, I, I always remember this. I don't know why on page 45, um, you talk about, this is pre-Civil War, a man named Martin Delaney, a black man who was an abolitionist and a newspaper man. And I quote from the book, he himself had been thrown out of Harvard Medical School when a majority of students, and I mean white students there, objected to the, quote, evil represented by the presence among them of someone, quote, we would not tolerate in our houses. I mean, I was stopped. I was just totally shocked. Like, what? Um, there's these kinds of amazing gems that are throughout this book as you, as you write about uh, social media and technology today and its impact on racial justice. So I, I thank you for that. Um, so final question. Downloading uh, cell phone videos, body cam videos onto social media. 
may be the only way to inform Americans about the reality of racial injustices. And there will always be forces who will use social media to undermine and distort that reality. So how can those of us who care about exposing and ending racial justice most effectively utilize social media platforms when a handful of privileged men, white men, own and control them? So this question, I hope you will leave us all with some hope. Hmm. I, I, I'll give Todd, I, I, let me, I'll be quick and give Todd the last word. Um, organize, organize. Um, organized people defeat organized power all the time. And we only get what we organize for. Social media, if we see ourselves purely as individuals who are the stars of our own shows, who go live and stream ourselves and take selfies and do all these things, if we only focus on that, if the solipsistic dimensions of this are what prevail, if we only use social media for gossip and for jokes and for memes, then we won't be successful. But if we organize, if we come together, if we're strategic, right? If we're strategic about how we use social media, if we communicate with one another about, how we, about social media, if we, if we organize around a common goal in the same way that we did in every other historical era, um, we will win. When we fight, we win. I, I would say, uh, tell the truth. Mm. It's a simple phrase, tell the truth. Uh, it involves... Um, uh, though the, uh, the the participation of our senses, you know, when I teach journalism, I tell the students that you, as a journalist, need to have heightened senses because the world is looking to you to tell them what happened, what you saw, what you heard, what you tasted, what you smelled. All that needs to be at a heightened level so that you take away from what you're seeing something you can then vividly recreate for those who were not there. Well, I think these new technologies give all of us that opportunity. And so I say, tell the truth and listen for truths. Look for truths. Continue to explore. Organize like Mike, Mike, like Mark says. Uh, utilize what it is that you learn and help you create a better society. Know that there are others out there who will not participate in this very noble venture, but it's the one that makes us most human. Could not have said it better from both of you. Thank you. Our thanks to Mark Lamont Hill and Todd Brewster, authors of the new book, Seen and Unseen, Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for Racial Justice. Thank you for joining us today. We also thank our audience for watching and participating live. And a special thank you to Marcus Books in Oakland for yes. fulfilling book orders. Uh, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. I'm Ladaris Cordell. Thank you and stay safe, everybody.